This is genius. This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to The Gritty Bowman. I've never seen so many mullets in my life. No, it's just about feeling good. You, you had more chins than a Chinese phone book for <laughs> a while. Did, yeah, it, it was, was bad. bad. Yeah. I mean, he's right. He said, Goonies never say die. <laughs> We're going. We got this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was pulling the trigger, but the safety was on. <laughs> I just Randy Black Not Eagle. Randy that's Black it. Eagle. Boom. That's that's my. That's how we roll. Just drop the <laughs> mic and walk away. <laughs> On this episode of Gritty Bowman, we hang out with traditional archer, conservationist, and film producer Clay Hayes of Twisted Stave Media. On this podcast, we are on location at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers annual rendezvous. Clay makes his own bows and hunts with them. He carves them out of a piece of wood. He's a real hardcore traditional archer. And he and I and Mark get to know each other on this podcast. We talk about his films, which I highly recommend. And I think Clay's films are especially good to share with your non-hunting friends. You can find his films at www.twistedstave.com. I really like Clay. He's a deep and thoughtful person, and his films are the same way. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. We're here at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous here in Missoula, Montana. And uh, Mark Brownlee is my co-host today. This, <laughs> yep, the Scottish-Canadian Spaniard. and freaking Spaniard crap. <laughs> and my uh, co-host, the Mexican. <laughs> uh, I, it's in there somewhere. Um, and then uh, we've got, as our guest today, Clay Hayes. Uh, and uh, Clay, you're, you, you have a... A brand that you're you're building, it's Twisted Stave. Yes, Twisted Stave. Not plural. No. It's yep. Twisted Stave. Yep. And uh, what is a Twisted Stave? So a stave is a hunk of wood that you build a bow out of. It's basically you take a, a tree and split it into quarters, and then you have four staves. Got it. And oftentimes Osage, which is what I oftentimes build bows out of, um, it's a real gnarly wood, and you have to look through a bunch of trees to find one that might make a good bow. And that those things are oftentimes when you split them, if the tree has some spiral to it, that stave will be twisted. Hence, twisted stave. Got it. Brilliant. Can you shoot a twisted stave? Absolutely. I've got a bow at my house that looks like a, uh, a prop off the front of an airplane. Really? One limb is, is kicked over this way, and the other limb is like this. They're, I mean, they're facing complete different directions that's cool yeah wow well we wanted to have you on the show and talk about um traditional bow shooting you 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 got a self bow right here yep um you've done some films yep. and some great film work we were talking about that earlier offline that uh we really enjoyed your films uh the first time i saw your film i know i saw it um a couple of different places but um your film i saw it at the back under hunters and anglers uh, get together in Portland. Actually, Ty put it on there and, mm-hmm. and uh, shared it with us. So, tell us about your films, and uh, if someone wants to go watch and see what Clay Hayes is all about, where can they go? So uh, they they can catch all my stuff on YouTube or Vimeo, or just go to my website, twistedstave.com. I've got everything up there; it's all free. All you got to do is get on there and, and watch. It's right on the homepage. Um. Untamed, the film that you saw, yep. uh, was the, the first film I ever did. And when I first started, it took me a long time to do, like three years yeah. or more. Um, and when I first started, I really didn't know exactly wh- what I wanted to do. I knew I had something I wanted to say. Uh, I didn't know exactly what that was. And it changed. The, the film, the way it started off, and yep. then through that shooting and editing and building process, it completely changed in a, into a... A whole different beast. Yeah. And ended up into the, the final product of what you saw, which I think is, I've heard from, you know, everybody from stick bow guys to high tech, you know, compound guys to long range, you know, hunt, you know, guys that shoot animals at 800 yards to non hunters. And it something in there yeah. resonates with everybody. And I was that, you know, really, the, it's the hearing from the non hunters that that see that film and and say man that was i i never understood it before but now i get it that 
really means the most to me out of, out of any of it. Don't you think, you know, it's just crazy, like, uh, bow hunters in general seem to connect so much better with non-hunters than rifle hunters do in general. And then you take a guy that shoots traditional, and they connect even more. Mm-hmm. It, it's like it's like there's a more a deeper trusting like you must be doing it for other reasons other than you know the stereotypical you just want to kill something yeah i think it's just a distilled down i mean it's when you when you're shooting a stick bow you it's getting back to the primal Game elements man, right yeah i mean yeah. I, I grew up in scotland right but i can remember as a kid running around mm-hmm. doing, you know yep. right halfway around the world and still shooting the same thing just inside you absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. People yeah. are just drawn to stick bows. I mean, you can see, you know, somebody, I'll, I'll have a stick bow sitting in the corner somewhere, and people are just, they go up to it, and they want to they wanna handle it. I mean, they're just cool. Yeah, they I are. Yeah. And for you, like, uh, you know, you, you're shooting self bows. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so for people who don't know, explain what that is. So a self bow is basically, well, it depends on who you talk to. Okay. I think of self bows as a single piece of wood, no other backing or anything like not that. Not laminated. Not laminated. It's not glass. No, no synthetic materials. Anything on there like that. Um, basically, I go out in the woods, cut down a tree, season it so it's dry, and I whittle a bow out of it, and I go hunting with it. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of manly. That's right? yeah. Like, oh yeah. It's kind of <laughs> like uh, you got one right here. Yeah. Um, and what's it made out of? This is Osage Orange. Okay. And uh, actually, when you when you first cut into Osage and split it, it's like a vibrant, almost a neon yellow. And then over time, it uh, it darkens with exposure to sunlight. Mm-hmm. And I've seen bows, you know, they're 25 years old that are still shooting, uh, and they're almost black just from darkening over age. Really? Yeah. Right? They're gorgeous bows. So how long can a self-bow last? Because they're... They, they break. If you build it well, if it's tillered right and the limbs are bending properly mm-hmm. and you take care of it, a good self bow will last a lifetime. No question about it. Really? Because you hear about guys who make them and break them. I mean, yeah. Um, I've broken a lot of them. I promise you. When you're, when you're first learning to build bows, you're going to break them and break a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, but once you get it down and, and understand how, what you need to do, uh, and, and, and how to make them bend properly. Uh, yeah, you can make a bow that's uh, just as durable as anything out there. How did you learn to do this? I bought a book. <laughs> what a book. That's brilliant. Uh, so I had always been interested in building bows. And when I was a little kid, just like you said, back right. in Scotland, um, you know, I would go out and, and hack off a branch off of a plum tree and string up a, an old hay string in there. And then I'd sh- be shooting these uh, arrows that are as big around as your thumb, you know, <laughs> and it'd shoot at about 10 feet. <laughs> and so I always kind of had that, that interest. And then when I was in, it was probably my senior year in high school, uh, I found a book called The Traditional Bowyer's Bible. And there's a lot of good bow building books out there, but that one is what got me started. And it finally gave me the instructions that I needed to actually build a decent bow. And I've been building bows since then, so since about 1999. And I, so p- previous to that, I was hunting with a compound. And then once I got was able to build a bow that I could actually shoot and felt comfortable with, I sold the compound went straight to a self bow. Right. So how many pounds is this bow? That's about, I've never had it on scale, um, yeah. but I would suspect it's about 55 at 29 okay. or so. And I have no idea how fast it shoots. Never shot any of them through chronographs. But with that bow right there, I shot, with this last year, I shot completely through a, a five-point bull. Pass-through? Yeah. Well, that's that's not manly or anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. That That's really neat. This... Um, I mean, that's so Anthony, cool. I whittled the tree down and then went and shot right through You know, Anthony's out. done that's a couple just, of these. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't know if he killed anything with his self bow. I think he might. I think he. I think I'm pretty sure he has. But um, these are. Uh, but I know he broke a couple. Yeah, are you? I mean, if you get into bow building, you're gonna break bows. And people always they they see my website and I've got a bunch of how to build um, 
how to build a bow videos on there. Uh-huh. And they want to start off with an Osage stave. And that st- a stave, like a good quality stave, is going to cost you over 100 bucks. And I always tell people, you do not want to spend $100 on a stave to learn on because you're going to screw it up right? Uh, if it's your first one. So I tell them to go out and find something that grows locally and um, choke cherry or if you're in the northeast hickory or any of that stuff, any of the fruit or nut bearing trees are gonna make a decent bow. Um and heard you can, ocean spray? Ocean spray. I've heard I've never tried it, but I've heard of people making good bows out of ocean spray. Um but you know when you do it that way you can afford to screw up. Yeah. And it, cause because if you pay a hundred or hundred and fifty bucks for a stave, you're gonna be nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I heard uh dogwood as well. Um so uh red osier dogwood, the the little short stuff um actually if you're if you go like total <coughs> primitive uh they make good arrow shafts really yeah i've never heard of anybody making a bow out of dogwood but the the arrow certainly okay i um had some indian friends that i knew that that use different uh different i don't remember I, I i swear they 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 had been using dogwood and uh ocean spray and it's for some of their stuff i don't know if it was for arrows and mm-hmm. then bows or but I just look at that and I'm like, that's intense. Yeah. You know, um, what do you, what do the, like, if you, most Native American Indians, is, I mean, would this look something like what they would have had? Not really. This is kind of a modern design. I mean, okay. you, the, the Native bows wouldn't have had an arrow shelf cut out. They would have been basically just don't cut that out of them. And uh, a lot of them didn't have a stiff riser. So this section, basically, it's a, it would have been a D-style bow. So it, it's basically the whole bow is a limb. So it's kind of like, um, what's his name, Howard Hill? No, Howard Hill's bows were more like this. Like when I say a D bow, I'm mm-hmm. saying that there's no stiff section at all. It's basically, it Just bends. Just one curve. Yep, it bends through its entire length. and. Huh. Uh, and I've I've made bows like that. Um, I prefer I can get more better accuracy out of a bow like this with a that's cut a little bit more towards center. Now you hear about like these Lakota Indians riding horses, legs are, you know shooting under the the main the Comanche and everything. Yeah. Using traditional gear, mm-hmm. How, it just blows my mind that they can have. Is that real ha- or is that Hollywood? That I mean I, I've I've read accounts uh, like firsthand. Well. Uh, biographies of yeah. like Crow Indians and things like that, um, and uh, you know it's it's real as far as I can tell. I mean, yeah, they, I've read but, accounts too. Like that's um, amazing. But the the reason they're doing that is well, when they're when they're hanging off the side of the horse, they're like they're in warfare. They're trying right. to not get shot, and the horse from, is like sh- yeah. From shield. my from my understanding, they're like shooting. Yeah, they have under a, the neck or over. Yeah. Yeah, so they have under. a they have a saddle that they can hook their leg over, and then they're like, their um, their drawing hand is on the other side, and their bow hand is on the other side of the horse's neck. So the horse's neck is like right here, and they're just, but they're shooting. I mean, they're not I, they're not going to be <laughs> yeah, accurate, dude. I'm sure, but they're just flinging arrows. They're right. trying to make people duck. Right. But I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, but but I from what I read, like firsthand accounts, and and uh, it, it sounded like they're far more accurate than than that. Like. Um, the ones that toured with, uh, we're probably butchering all this, but um, <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure we are. I have to go back and read a book again. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, uh, no, I. But it still, it still blows my mind that they had uh, this primitive equipment and yet felt this accuracy. I, I've referenced this before. Uh, one of my favorite books that I read was um, "Land of Spotted Eagle," mm-hmm. I think, uh, by Luther Standing Bear. I think I think I could be totally wrong, but. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's his, you know it's it, it it's about growing up as a Sioux or a Lakota Indian and they talked about um, you know the little boys that walk around and they shoot grasshoppers and locusts like just flying through the yeah. grass and they just from the time they're just old mm-hmm. enough to draw a bow they're shooting at moving and flying yeah. objects by the time they're a man oh it's yeah. just it's just part of uh, walking yeah it's 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 an extension of their body um, have, uh, you ever heard of Ishi? Oh. Uh-huh. So uh, Ishii is a, a, a fabulous story, captivating. So he's, like, in the 1920s, uh, this, uh, ha- well, he was completely naked, 
Native American comes stumbling out of the woods in somewhere in California. Mm -hmm. Last wild Native American out there. Yep. Uh, Saxon Pope was his physician. So he was the last of a band of Indians uh, called the Yana, Yana, maybe? Yeah. Um, but he's the one that got Saxon Pope started in archery, and he was like um, almost his mentor. Okay. It's uh, Ishi in Two Worlds. If you guys ever uh, yeah, I want to read it. come across that book, it's fascinating. It, it tells the Who whole... Who wrote it? It's a bi- I don't know. It's a biographer. Okay. Um, but it tells the whole story of his people and how he came to be the last one. And it's, I mean, parts of it are terribly, terribly sad. Right. I mean, just the things that they went through. Mm-hmm. But the, the archery part of it, I mean, he shot, the way he shot was he would hold, he, he made a, a, a short flat bow that was backed with sinew, basically take the leg, um, yep. the sinew out of a, a deer's leg, pound it out, glue it to the back That's of the bow. That's what our, yep. I had seen our friends do with yep. uh, ocean spray. But he he would have a little short bow, and instead of shooting it, you know, like this, like we would normally do, At an he, angle. he would shoot it like this and then shoot off the top of the bow and draw to his chest. But um, you, wow, you, you look at it. They said that, uh, uh, so Saxon Pope said that he wasn't worth a damn on like a target, like, like the old standard English when they were shooting, mm-hmm. you know, 80, 100 yards, 180 yards, whatever. He couldn't do well on that. But on game and hunting, he was deadly. I mean, like, didn't miss. It's, uh, why? I wonder why. That's what he know. did all the time, I'll bet you that. Well, like, from he, when he was the yeah, spec. Yeah, yeah but it. if you can hit a deer at that, why can't you hit a target, too? I don't know. He's, uh, he, well, he was shooting instinctively, purely yeah. instinctively. I mean, you could, there's no way to really aim shooting that way. Yeah. And from what I've seen, shooting instinctively, I used to shoot instinctively. I don't anymore. I aim now. But, um, and why, go ahead, keep going on. Well, when I, when I was shooting instinctively, I could do the same thing. I could, because you're, cause when you're shooting instinctively, like you have to have the highest level of concentration and that game gives you that, right? Whereas a target, you're just like, ah, it's just this round thing out in the field. You kind of, you, if you're shooting a bunch, you know, you're you just don't, shooting. Yeah. You're you just, just going through some it. motions. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that's my theory anyway. Yeah. Okay, but you you found that you were dead on some days, and some days you just weren't. Yeah, well, shooting instinctively. I mean, even in the same shooting session, I mean, I'd have, if I was shooting at 15 yards, you know, I would be drilling a baseball for the, I'd like put three arrows right in the center. i go pull those things, and then I just, I don't know, get distracted. Something wasn't quite right, and then I would be, you know, hitting in a two-foot circle, and it was just... Right. It was never, I, di- I didn't have the level of consistency that I really wanted. And um, I started gap shooting, basically. And so what I'm doing when I come to full draw, I'm using my arrow tip as a, basically as a sight pin. And that pin is, in my peripheral vision, it's underneath what, I'm, what my, my target is, what I'm wanting to hit. And that has given me the level of consistency and confidence that I never had shooting instinctively. Yeah. And that's where you basically just, uh, you know, you, you just put the thing, you you know, if the arrow's tip is right on it, mm-hmm. it's X distance. If yep. it's, you know, an inch above it or two inches or, or below, you, you can figure out your yardage that yeah. way. And I don't consciously think about the distance or the gap. It's just the, the left it's and just right. A, an idea reference now. Yeah, I mean that the, the the what that gap is is you shoot enough at, at certain distances and you, just, you get to figure it out what it, what that gap is. I was telling you I did that when I was a kid. That's kind of I'd use the tip of the arrow and just kind of mm-hmm. I just fi- finally I just knew and I'd walk around and I shot all the time and I just just hit what I was aiming at and uh, and and now you know it just seems like and then I just never picked up a stick bow again after I was like fourteen. Yeah, but and you're getting back into it. I am. I've got a. I've got a bow, and so I got a question. A couple for you. more, and yes. What? 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 What spawned this? Because I see, and I don't know if it's just me noticing things now. Yeah. But it seems to me like there's more guys 
like you who are have been shooting compound for a long time and are just now making the switch have you seen that same trend or is it just me yeah and i'm not sure that uh, for me that it was related to any kind of any per any other person like Mm -hmm. influencing me it's something like that i've i uh like we went to the um full draw film school a couple years ago mark and i and the, the person I was most excited to meet at the school was South Cox. He's like a giddy schoolgirl. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was excited, man. I, I, I had watched him for years, and I see, and I love soccer stick bows and what he, you know, just the craftsmanship and the beauty of the bows. And yeah. I have always, like, coveted one, like, wanted one. And, and it's always been in my mind, like, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And I, it's nothing related to what anybody else thinks or says or it's like i've just i've been i've read like so many native american indian books and and mountaineer mountain trapper kind of books they got a whole inventory of them you know how the west was one kind of stuff and uh like kidnapped chilled indian like white people raised with indians and then what white people raising indians and all the whole thing like it's always been kind of fascinating so primitive equipment even when it comes down to like a uh a muzzle loader or something. All that stuff is really fascinating to me and I'm really interested. Well, when it, and, and having shot a lot as a kid, you know, a stick bow, I just kind of thought, I just was like, I'm going to do that when I get time. Yeah. And, uh, and it just kind of over time, I, I've been talking about it and thinking about it. And I never have been one of those guys, like a lot of my friends are like, why would you ever want to do that? Mm-hmm. And I wonder if it's because I grew up shooting it. I mean, my dad got me my first one when I was like 11, 12 years old. And then I shot religiously like every day for year, for four years after that until I was really accurate. And uh, I just walk around the woods where I grew up and just, I just carried my bow everywhere I went and shot it all the time. And so for me, um, and at the time I didn't know anything about a compound. Yeah. But I remember when I got my first compound, I was like 15. 16 something like that I, I got a compound and i was like and i just ditched that stick bow because mm-hmm. it was new and cool yeah. and fast and all this other new stuff right technology and, and uh and then i just never went back to it mm-hmm. but but then as i got older i was like i i was like i need i i it's always been on my to-do list right get back to it get back after it and it just finally has i've just finally picked it up and started doing it I also realize that there's limitations to, um, like, it takes a certain amount of practice Mm -hmm. to be accurate with a stick bow. It requires a certain amount of time and effort Mm -hmm. that a compound doesn't. Yeah. You know, I can can hit what I'm aiming at with a compound at 20 yards 100% of the time without ever practicing. Yeah. Um, I can't do that with a stick bow. Yeah. And so... I've I've tabled the stick bow thing, so put it aside, and said I'm not going to do it right now because my life it's it's not it's something I'm willing to put time into right now. Just don't now. have the time. But now uh, I'm getting a little more time, and I've realized if I do that, I'll be 80 or yeah. 90. Or I'll never have the time, right? You got to prioritize it yeah. in if it's something you really want to do, and um, and then. It just has all come together, but I have seen this kind of rise in interest yeah. uh, in in people wanting to shoot traditional yeah. archery. What do you think the guys that are <clears throat> so for bow hunters? I, I think there's a lot of there, there's some guys in there that are bow hunting now that, in my opinion, aren't really in their heart. They're not bow hunters. They're they're um, like if you were to if I was to give a guy a choice and say you have one weapon to hunt elk with for the rest of your life what's it going to be is it going to be a bow or is it going to be a rifle you know a bow hunter you, you have bow hunters they're going to pick rifle because really in their heart they're they're rifle hunters there's some, nothing wrong with that right right but the guys who are bow hunters in their soul they do it for a reason and that reason is because it's more of a challenge it gets you closer it's more of an intimate type of thing and for those guys it's fascinating for me to try and figure out like why they do things the way they do them um what's 
like if you are a bow hunter in your core, what's holding you back from taking that next step and getting back to traditional equipment? I, I look at it like this, like, and I know what you mean because I love bow hunting, mm-hmm. but I love hunting with a rifle too. Um, I, I kind of like it all. Like I'm not, uh, you know, I, one of the reasons I got into bow hunting, you know, that I really, I mean, just cause of the challenge and stuff, but, but when I hadn't shot a lot of animals, I was, I was, I was just as excited to go with a rifle. Oh, yeah. But once rifle hunting became, you know, fairly easy mm-hmm. compared to an archery hunt, I wanted to, I wanted to do archery hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, and the seasons for archery and the hunting opportunity oh, yeah. and all that. I know a lot of guys who hunt archery, not because that's their preferred choice, but because it favors, you, you get longer hunting seasons, weather's great, you know, sometimes, uh, the, the elk are in a rut, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons to favor that. If you're whitetail hunting or you're hunting blacktail and you're in public places, the season's like two months long or you're, you're hunting in some city limits where you can't use a, a rifle, but you, there, there are bow seasons for yeah. those areas. There's just all these advantages and opportunities if you come, become proficient with a bow mm-hmm. that are not there with a rifle. Instead, you draw a tag every three or four years with a rifle or whatever. So yeah. I see, I think there are a lot of guys who hunt rifle uh, or bow because for practical reasons, not oh, yeah. because they would, yeah. they, in their heart, they're that way. Mm-hmm. I kind of feel like I'm a hunter, period. Yeah. And whatever, it, whatever I want to use, I'll use. I tend to prefer using bows so if, to if, guns. If, um like for me, if if I, if, if I was, if someone came to me like you said and said you have to pick one, yeah, forever, yes, um, I would choose a compound because it's kind of this balance. But between, it's a, it's, a, but it's a bow. I mean, a bow, a bow versus a rifle. Yeah. Yep. But if if you said stick bow or a rifle, I'd go rifle. Really? I'd go rifle. You'd probably starve with the stick bow. And that's just <laughs> that's it. Like the like the reason is is that just why is that? Because. I'm certain I can kill more animals. I like as much as the 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 experience of the hunt is important to me. Yeah. Another part of it is just practical. Yeah. I want meat in my freezer. Absolutely. Yeah. And I want a lot of meat in my freezer every year wild game. And and it's almost a guarantee yeah. with a rifle. And that's and and so if it came down to to one option, but I feel like with a compound today, that's also almost a guarantee. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. You know, you can shoot so far and so accurately with a compound yeah. now that that even me, even I can kill elk regularly. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it's a it's a uh, but it's you a could tool. Do, you could do that with a stick bow. You just have it's, it's and I a, don't have enough experience to know that you can do it. You just have to. Be, you have to. There are guys that you see that have done it for years, yeah. right? South Cox gets yeah. it done every year, yeah. but. There's a lot of guys shooting traditional mm-hmm. that how never much, kill much, anything, know, Clay. Yeah. How so much they time kinda, you got to put in to be to be like that, like you're saying, to be consistent. So let me, yeah. That, before you answer that question, because it's a it's a good question. My my close friend Anthony, you know, we, we've been hunting partners forever for a long time, and Anthony goes out and he he makes his own self bow. He he does he he has a sweet recurve and he's different traditional bows and he kills animals with them and he hunts for like three or four years with a stick bow and he can't miss and he's filling his freezer with all kinds of stuff and then he goes three four years and doesn't hit anything despite like tremendous opportunities deals he could have should have closed on he just didn't yep it just and he's like and he was still practicing quite a bit a little fall off you know when he wasn't hitting and he's like he attributed it to I just gotta I gotta practice more with a stick bow and I don't have the time. I think a lot of that type of stuff could be solved with a system of shooting that allows you to not fall victim to target panic and that type of thing. Because that's what's going on. I mean, he, he somebody gets in a funk like that and it's it's all mental. I mean, they're doing it themselves, and if they have a way to shoot that makes sure that they're consistent and the same every time. And I think the way that I'm shooting now does that. It's just like, I mean, 
I mean, it's it's no different really than shooting a compound. I mean, you have a peep sight, you have a pin, it all lines up, and that keeps you lined up. Yeah. For me, my peep sight is my knuckle in the by my ear, and my pin is my the tip of my arrow. I mean, I can't not be lined up if I'm if I have proper form. That's a big. That's a yeah, big yeah. Thing. You got to maintain that. You got to maintain that back tension. But so long as you have those couple of things, I mean, I'm very confident that what I shoot at is going to die. And the real, reality is on, on an animal, the kill zone's fairly large. It's not like you have to hit a dot on a target, yeah. a 12 ring. It, you don't. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, 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 so I don't know. I don't know from enough experience whether I could, uh, you know, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I'm embarking on that journey. I know Aaron is like, Aaron Snyder, he's been, he, he's taken it up and he's very accurate. And he's, he's um, shooting very well uh, on courses. And he's like, yeah, he still has a flyer every now and then mm-hmm. that doesn't go where he expected it to go. But I have no doubt he's going to kill some, some animals this year with, with his recurve. I, I think if, you know, if, you're, if you're a good hunter and you just commit to that that's the biggest thing is you have to accept the limitations and commit to getting within those uh, the, your comfort zone you're going to kill something i mean but the, the biggest thing is like uh you know a guy that that draws some hard to draw sheep tag and he takes a rifle and a compound with him 99 times out of 100 he's going to end up shooting him with a rifle because he's going to give it a, tri- a time or two with a bow and if things don't work out and like we know yeah, most of the time with a bow, things aren't going to work out. That's what makes it so fun. And yeah. you got to you got to give it everything you've got. And if you limit yourself to that or a stick bow, you will give it everything you've got, and you'll be successful. So why do you think a stick bow? And what so? You know, why are you so into a stick bow over a compound bow? I love to shoot them. Mm-hmm. They are beautiful. They're timeless. Um, I mean, I think it's, and I said it in Untamed, it's like, if there's a campfire somewhere, people are just drawn to it. And I don't know what it is. It's something inside of us that's been there forever. Yeah. It's just magnetic. And that's the way I feel about stick bows. I think, you know, and I think even though maybe a lot of compound shooters won't admit it, but they think it's cool. They might not go (laughs) to it, but... You know, um, you know. Surprisingly, I I've got very little. Um, you know, there are a lot of guys who still want us to talk about compounds, and we do. But on on our podcast, we've talked a lot about traditional mm-hmm. uh, tackle as well, and um, and for the most part, yeah, most guys that I that I've met and the guys listening to our show, they don't they don't mind hearing about traditional hunting. Yeah, um, I think there was a time where there was quite a a uh, negative attitude toward toward traditional talk and hunting, and and in that, and that same you know it, it's on both sides of the aisle. You know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, traditional kind of elitist. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of the fly fisherman, like sticking his nose up at the at the bait fisherman. And I know? think you know, like I, I have made it part of my mission with Twisted Stave to help as many compound shooters to see the light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for me, I got. I've just started hunting the last two years, right? And the bow part is, it's like you say, it's just something I think caveman like to mm-hmm. send me, yep. right? But my goal is to is to kill my first animal, hopefully this year, um, <laughs> with my bow. Uh-huh. But my goal is to get to that. Awesome. I want to get to that. I w- mm-hmm. After I went down and saw S- South Cox and went through the whole process, that, and he's just a brilliant person, mm-hmm. human being, besides his incredible skills with making bows and, and stuff. But just there was something about it. You know, just something oh. you can't explain, but it's yep. it speaks to you. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. It's yeah. just. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you, people, um, even guys that shoot compounds, you give them a recurve to shoot, and it's just like, man, that is fun. I just yeah. like slinging arrows. Well, I'll tell you this, that um, Aaron, one of the reasons Aaron is really interested and really enjoying it and, and, and really knocking it out is because shooting a compound became 
a little too easy. Like it just it just was like automatic, yeah. right? To the point where his accuracy is so good, his consistency is so good that there's not a lot of challenge in it anymore. Yeah. And so shooting at the archery range is is just doesn't it doesn't hold the the joy and the excitement that it used to. Well, you pick up a stick bow, and all of a sudden that 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 little kid inside that's just you know anxious for the challenge and and learning and all that it it comes back out yeah i think the guys that that love bow hunting and would bow hunt regardless of season you know they'll bow hunt through rifle season or whatever yeah i think those guys i mean they're into it like i said before because of the challenge and you know i'm i'm biased of course but it seems like with all of the things that you can get all the the flat shooting compound, the the range finders, the yep. everything, it just chips away and chips away and chips away at that at that challenge, and this brings all of that back. But but don't you don't you agree though? Like, there's also like with 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 all of us, we want the challenge, and we also we also like the nostalgia that's associated with uh-huh. it. Yeah, but we're also like at heart, like we're all like little tinkerers, and we love technology. You know, I yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's just a that's a that's a a human trait. I mean, right. we are we're problem solvers. We're yeah, we tinker with stuff. And, we, and so, like, there's this whole technology side where you know we're fascinated by high speed, high tech, carbon fiber. You know, all that kind of stuff, and um, you know, all the mechanical designs that come into this this kind of bow. And there, and so I can see like we had Tim Gillingham on the podcast. You know. I don't think that guy will ever shoot a traditional bow, but he just geeks out on the technology that's out there and 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 the engineering that goes into that. Um, well, I'm that way with cameras. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you know, you could you could dig yourself a deep yeah. hole <laughs> with camera gear. Uh, yeah, you can. Oh, but, deep, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that exactly, and that whole thing that takes, you know, so I think that there's. Uh, there's you got both going at it right and um but shooting a traditional bow you know really i know for aaron it was just something that was a lot harder and got him more interested i for me it's like i'm not that accurate i mean i'm good i'm pretty good but i'm not i'm not like i still have some i still have some conquering to do when it comes to the compound right things i haven't achieved that i would like to so it's still challenging and still very rewarding for me and uh but but I can see where you know if 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 I didn't have so much growth still ahead of me, and I'd be like man this is this is just uh i'm not the fire's not there anymore mm-hmm. um and I think there's and I think that's what we were, you were asking earlier. I think that's true for a lot of compound bow hunters at this point. The technology has come so far, and the accuracies and so many of them are so good that they're moving to traditional because like Aaron. They're bored now. Yeah. They're not. It doesn't have the same uh, excitement, and it doesn't generate the same re- rewarding feeling that it used to. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, like I'm, like I said, I'm not quite there because I still find shooting a, a compound extremely difficult. I still have, you know, s- some growth to, to to do. But I think there's a lot of a lot of guys just like Aaron that are they're done. Like they've, they've done it. Mm-hmm. So now it's time to to move into something that's more fun and more challenging to shoot. But I think it really is applicable to the guys that are hardcore that just want to shoot bows. Mm -hmm. Because if you're just out there, you know, for the, uh, the hunt in general, um, and, and you're, you know, you got bow hunters who shoot every day because they want to pull back a bow and Mm -hmm. feel that arrow go. Yeah. Then you got bow hunters that hunt, not because they, just because of completely, they, they don't shoot their bows every day. Yeah, they they're not have, interested. They, they hunt in for it. those practical reasons you had mentioned earlier, not because they have a deep love of bow hunting yep. or, or archery. Yep, I I have a deep seated love for archery. I just love to shoot a bow. Yep. Well, your film, um, Untamed, mm-hmm. that 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 film, I highly it's you know it's it. it it's out there, available, public consumption. I highly recommend everybody go see that film. Go watch it. Go see what Clay is all about. See what the message, see the message that you're, you're promoting out there. And, um, and then you have another film mm-hmm. that's uh, coming out yep. soon. Yep. I haven't determined exactly when it's coming out, but they are showing it here yeah. at yep. this event. 
and that film is called Ascent. Ascent. Yep. And uh, I'm excited for that because now you've got a little, even a little more skill under your belt from from the first film. Yep. And uh, I know right, from film to film, I'm hoping I'm getting better each time. Yeah, you can definitely tell. I mean, even with the trailer uh, that I put out for this one, you can definitely tell it's a a couple notches above what the what a, a t- untamed was. At the same time, I mean, when it's raw like that, the, um, you know, actually, if if uh, if I had to pick one and say which one is better, it's untamed because it's and it doesn't have anything. To do, the cinematography in this one's be- better. Yeah, the filmmaking, the uh, the transitions, and all that stuff is better. But Untamed was just like I had something deep in my soul I wanted to say, and that was just raw from the heart. And it speaks to a lot of different people. Yeah, this one, and that was a heavy, kind of a heavy film. Mm-hmm. This one is not as heavy. It's more of a kind of an adventure film. It's still good. Yeah, but it's not. It's kind of. It's different. Yeah, that's neat. Well, I'm excited. Go out there and check them out, twistedstave.com. Yeah. And uh, I want to, you know, keep checking in and see how you're doing. Maybe get on a call in the future and do a little more, yeah, if you I know, can, just talk. If I can help you guys anyway, uh, Cause make, the, make the transition. See the, <laughs> see the light, right? That's see right. the light. That's right. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Clay, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Stay gritty, man. Yeah, I cheers. appreciate Stay it. Stay gritty. Cheers. Okay, Gritty friends, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes, Podbean, or Stitcher. We love reading your reviews. And connect with us on social media if you're on there. Look us up on Facebook and Instagram, and take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can receive notifications when we upload new videos. We've got a sweet deal with Mountain Ops. You get 20% off on all Mountain Ops supplements, combo packs, and apparel when you type in the word gritty at checkout. If you're a hardcore elk hunter or you want to be, go to the Elk 101 website online and check them out. Our friend Corey Jacobson is killing it with some of the best elk hunting information and entertainment on the web. If you haven't heard, we're doing a huge gear giveaway to try and grow and expand the gritty community on Facebook and Instagram. I asked a bunch of friends to pitch in on this gear giveaway, and they all came through with some awesome stuff. Our friends at Kefaru, Rockslide, First Light, Phelps Game Calls, One Shot Gear, Mountain Ops, Triple X Archery, Blacktail Outdoors, and Is It September Yet are pitching in some sweet gear for the giveaway. We'll announce all the details in the next few weeks. All you have to do to be entered to win is like our Gritty Bowman Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. All right, friends, let me leave you with one other quote from Theodore Roosevelt who said, It behooves every man to remember that the work of the critic is of altogether secondary importance and that, in the end, progress is accomplished by the man who does things. We all have a choice. We can be people who do things or people who criticize the work of others. It's pretty simple, really. Get out there and do your thing. Good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs> <laughs>